Tonight, to continue our study on the Gospel of John, turn to John chapter 20, verse 30. John chapter number 20 and verse number 30. John 20, verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Father, I pray that you bless the reading of your word, the preaching and teaching of your word to the hearts of the people. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. As I've said to you before, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what's called the synoptic gospels. I don't necessarily call them that. That's just a common term. Simply means that all three of these gospels complement each other and give a one view uh, generally of the life of Christ. The Gospel of John is different. It's entirely different. And the Gospel of John, therefore, comes under severe criticism because it is different. You wouldn't believe how many people assault the Gospel of John, especially the ninth chapter of John where he said, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe? He said, I that speak to thee am he. You'll find that the new Bibles don't like that. And the reason they don't like that is because it is a clear, it is the clearest statement in the New Testament by the Lord Jesus himself about his deity, that he is the Son of God. So uh, you'll find that going back 2,000 years ago, a uh, controversy had already come up about the identity of the Son of God. And as I've said to you before, you can get everything in the Bible right and get him wrong and forget the rest of it. You can get everything in the Bible right, but if you've got Christ wrong, it's all wrong. Put it that way. It's all wrong. And uh, because he is absolutely the, the, uh, the object, the subject, and the burden of the Bible from Genesis through Revelation. So in the Gospel of John, you have seven signs or seven sign miracles. That's quite remarkable because the, the Gospel of John calls them signs. Matthew, Mark, and Luke is not burdened with that kind of statement, but John is. Signs. And the Gospel of John even tells you the first miracle that the Lord Jesus performed when he turned the water into wine. And the Bible calls that this beginning of miracles did the Lord Jesus perform. So there's a reason if John wants to call your attention to this, it must be important. When you go through all seven of them, you learn a lot about the, uh, the burden of the Apostle John about what he wants you to know about Christ because these miracles, and we call them signs in the Gospel of John, are very important. It's remarkable how that the first thing or the first miracle that the Lord performed was turning water into wine. If you go back to the book of Exodus and see where Moses went before Pharaoh, you'll find that the first miracle outside of this rod turning into a serpent the first miracle that was performed by the rod was to turn water into blood. That was the initiation or the beginning of the, of the ministry of Moses and Aaron to, uh, to the children of Israel. Now red wine would look like blood, wouldn't it? So what we have is water being turned into wine. And we have here then the beginning of the miracles or the signs in the Gospel of John. They clearly want to give you a message. It's clearly telling you something that you need to know that doesn't bear on the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. It bears on the salvation of individual people. So the first miracle is recorded in John chapter number 2 where he turns the water into wine. And he tells you in John chapter number 2 and verse 11, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. If you ever go to the Holy Land, you'll find that there is a church there in Cana of Galilee that's supposed to be built on the very spot where the Lord turned the water into wine. Whether that happened, I'm going to say this about these. I've been over there, I forget now, I know it's five, maybe six times. And everywhere, practically everywhere in the New Testament that it talks about something important happening, there's a church. The Byzantines, for example, built churches on these spots so they could so they could keep them uh, for uh, posterity down through the ages. And whether or not this is the actual spot that these happen or not is not important to me because I believe the Bible. 
But you can go to Cana of Galilee and you'll find that there is a church there that's supposed to be built on the very spot where the water was turned to wine. In the Gospel of John, chapter number 4, we have the healing of the uh, official son in Capernaum. And if you'll know in John, chapter number 4, verse number 46, you'll note that it says, uh, So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee where he'd made the water wine. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And uh, the nobleman said, verse 46, Sir, come down ere my child die. And Jesus said to him in verse 50, Go thy way, thy son liveth. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke unto him, and he went his way. He inquired of the servants, and uh, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. He inquired of them the hour when he began to amend. They said, Yesterday at the seventh hour. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which the Lord Jesus said to him, Thy son liveth, now watch this, and himself believed and his whole house. Here's a Gentile believing. Right off the bat in the Gospel of John, we have a Gentile believing. Remember? You remember I told you that the first person who confessed that the Lord Jesus Christ was the Son of God at the crucifixion was a what? He was a Gentile. He was a centurion. And he was a Gentile. The reason for this is because the Gospel of John is not written to Jews alone. It's written to Jews and Gentiles. It's written to anyone for whosoever will. And so we find this. And then John chapter number 5, we have another healing. We have the healing of the paralytic at Bethesda. John 5, John chapter number 5 and verse 1, we can go down and read this. If you'll notice in verse 2, there is at Jerusalem of the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda. The Hebrew the word Bethesda means house of mercy, house of mercy. If you go to Jerusalem right now, I've been to the ruins. You can, go, you can go up to the edge and look down. It's about 30 feet down into the ground. And you can see the actual pool of Bethesda as it stood 2,000 years ago. You've got to keep in mind that anytime you go back that far in time, the, the land surface is going to get built up. This is how tells come into existence. Say, so what's a tell? A tell is a mound, a man-made mound that is a place where, for example, you have a civilization that gets bulldozed, you know, uh, through war, or famine, whatever reason, and then another one comes along, they just build right on top of it. But as they build layer after layer, the tell begins to grow, and it gets higher and higher and higher. You can go to Masada and stand at Masada and look down on the plains of Esdraelon, where the Battle of Armageddon is going to take place. And Napoleon said it's the most natural battlefield in the earth. If you stand at the top of Megiddo, because that's where you are, at Megiddo, you have 22 distinct separate layers underneath your feet. Isn't that an amazing thing? You talk about old, that's old. 22 distinct layers of civilizations under your feet. So what you have when you go over there now, you can go to Jerusalem and look down at Bethesda, and you can see where the original Bethesda was, then you can see where the Romans built on top of it, then you can see what was built on top of that, and it goes down about 30 to 35 feet into the ground. But it's there, just like the Bible says, it's there. Just like the pool of Siloam, they found it too, it's there. Just like the spring of Gihon, it's there. Just like Hezekiah's tunnel, from the spring of Gihon that carried the water into the city. It's there. They found the tunnel. They found ancient Hebrew inscriptions on the side of the tunnel walls. And the ancient Hebrew inscription says that we were picking with our picks and we could hear our brethren coming from the other direction. And it's quite an engineering achievement when you think about it because they didn't have back then what we've got today. And they were digging from two sides and they came together and they joined together and they opened up that tunnel underneath Jerusalem's Temple Mount so that the water could flow into the city if they were being besieged by an army on the outside. And that's the first thing that'll get you is lack of water. That'll get you quick. And so uh, Hezekiah had that tunnel dug according to the scripture. The Bible says he did. But you see now they have archaeological proof that the scripture is correct because they found the tunnel. 
And I mean, you can get on the internet and type that, just type in the tunnel of Hezekiah or the, uh, uh, or, or the, uh, or the ancient Hebrew, Hebrew script that's on it and a, a lot of beautiful photographs of that. And it's the ancient Hebrew script. It's not the square letters that you see today. It's the ancient slanted letters, which of course dates back to the time of Hezekiah. If it had been square letters, then it would have been out of place. See, it would have been something that someone added later to, uh, to, to, as a fraud or a fakery. This is ancient Hebrew script proving once again that the Bible is correct. Amen. Amen. The archaeologist has never dug up anything that causes me to doubt my Bible. So in any event, he was healed at the pool of Bethesda. Now this is the house of mercy. I want you to notice please how the Lord is showing them how he has power over sickness. He has power to change water to wine. And then he continues to manifest greater and greater power as these miracles are performed. In John chapter number 6, he feeds 5,000. John chapter number 6 and verse number 16, he feeds 5,000 people. John 6 verse 16. And you'll read, you can read the, case, the, the, the story here in John chapter number 6 about feeding them. But what's important is what follows where he says, I am the bread, verse, 30, verse 38 and verse 35, I am the bread of life. I know you have eaten, verse 33, I know you have eaten physical bread, but there's something that your soul needs that is far greater than physical bread. I am the bread of life. And he, of course, he used the occasion where he fed them to show them that he is the bread of life. The type of that in the Old Testament is the manna that came down. God rained manna upon them. They could pick up manna six days a week on the sixth day, enough to do them two days to get through the Sabbath. But if they tried to hoard more on the sixth day than they needed, they would, it would rot. And the worms would smite it and the manna would rot showing them that they, what God was telling them was that, no, it's not up to you to preserve, it's up to me to supply. I'll take care of giving you what you need for that Sabbath day. It's a day of rest. There'll be no manna on the Sabbath day. The day before the Sabbath, you'll get a double portion. And that's what he did. And he took care of them, the bread of life. The Lord Jesus Christ is more than a double portion for any of us in this house tonight. He is the bread of life for all of us that hung it. But it continues. In John chapter number 6, this is one of the most remarkable things in the whole Bible, and I'll tell you why. Look at John chapter number 6 and verse number 16. John chapter number 6 and verse 16. When the evening was come, his disciples went down to the sea, entered into his ship, went over the sea toward Capernaum, and it was now dark. Jesus was not come to them. The sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, watch this, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh to the ship, and they were afraid. He said, it is I, be not afraid. Here's why it's important. He had manifested miracles up until, these po up until this point. But the things that he had done up until this point were things that relate to the earth in the sense that here's somebody that could work miracles. Elijah could do that. Elisha did that. The Old Testament prophets performed miracles, and they, did, they performed miracles because of the power of God. He's going to show them now the difference between a miracle worker and God. You see, he said to the sea and the wind, be still. The sea and the wind is not intelligent. They cannot respond to any call or any claim like that. The same power that went forth in his word that said, be still, was in Genesis chapter number 1 that said, be his word is a creative word. He is the creator. Here he is manifesting his holiness in a remarkable way. By walking on the water, he is saying to everybody present at that day, here's the water and here I am. And that water has no effect on me. I live in a different world. As the creator, he had that power of holiness to where he was not subject to the laws of physical science or death. He had to give himself to death. He had to lay his life down. No man could take his life from him. He had to lay it down. They couldn't kill him. 
The death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary, dear friend, was the death that he gave himself to. He offered himself without spot to God. That's holiness. And that holiness of God is the thing that really gets a hold of you. And, 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 and I guess the word would be sanctify you and give you power with God is the sense that, yes, we have a physical world, but he is eminently above this physical world. We have a physical creation, but he is vastly superior to it. You see, the natural man with his telescopes and with his scientific analysis and with his microscopes and all of this stuff, the natural man can only understand the natural world. In other words, the physical world that he lives in, that he's part of, because he's physical. He has no concept of a spirit being that is invisible that brought all of this into existence. Everything that exists, and I don't care how big the universe is, that's meaningless to me. The bigger it is, it shows me how big God is. <laughs> Amen. And I mean, sometimes when you think about that, it'll blow your mind. But he's not big in the sense that God is some huge thing like that, though he could be if he wanted to. He's big in the sense that he is an eternal, holy being. And the universe exists because he exists. And he was giving them proof positive when he was in this world 2,000 years ago. He walked right across the top of the water. The water wasn't supporting him. The water didn't support him. How did he do it, preacher? He did it by the power of God. He did it by the power of a man who had completely yielded himself to God. How did Peter walk on the water? He put his eyes on the Lord Jesus and he walked on it, but he only walked on it because of the one who was holding him up. Christ walked on it because he was Christ. And there's a vast difference between the two, but now the, it continues. It continues. Another healing is in John chapter number nine where he heals the man that is born blind. He's born blind. John 9. This man becomes a picture of Israel. And Israel is directly involved in it. The leaders of Israel, they cast him out of the synagogue. They hate what happened to him. And so the Lord finds him in John chapter number 9, verse 35. He heard they'd cast him out. When he'd found him, he said to him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Now, you know, I don't, have, I don't have the textus receptus in front of me. I don't have the, you know, the received text and all that. If I had it, then I could give you the Greek words that this is translated from. You know, there wouldn't be any problem whatsoever. And I, if, I had, if I had Nestle Allen's critical apparatus, you say, what is that? That's what, a, that's what a Greek scholar will use to translate the Greek New Testament. He will use Nestle Allen's critical apparatus, which means... All of the Greek manuscripts available, unctuals and cursives and everything that's available, all of the witnesses, if he's going to translate into the New Testament, he's going to appeal to that. And all of these different sources, he's going to find out which ones agree the most with what he's going to try to put down in English. He wants, he wants, he wants the more agreement, the more authority in what he says. See, are you, are you following me on this? All these Greek manuscripts, the more of them... The more of them that agree, and they don't, all, they don't agree, by the way. When you get outside of the Textus Receptus and you get off into the Alexandrian text, they disagree in thousands of places, folks. Thousands of places. The Vaticanus, the Alexandrinus, the uh, Washingtonius, and all the unctuals, and all of the leg, leg, uh, le, uh, what do they call them, legionaries, or whatever it is. All of that stuff. They disagree among themselves thousands and thousands of times, yet they will throw out the King James Bible and they will go as a source of authority to that that is in complete disagreement with each other. What do you think about that? Does that sound like scholarship to you? And Nestle Allen, now I'll give you this tonight. Now think on what I'm saying to you. This is important. Nestle Allen, these are, these are German scholars, Nestle Allen will show you they've got little letters. They've got a legend, you know, when you get a map, it's got a legend. And they'll, they've got a little, uh, it's, a, it's a funny little M, and that rep represents the majority text. And every word that shows up in a, in, a, in a sentence, they'll have a reference to that word and to the authority at the bottom for that word. Well, that's okay. That's fine. 
And the majority text will agree with what you've got in your hand right here. The Son of God. And some, some, I haven't looked at it for a while, and I, it's out there in that building. And as soon as I get it in here, I'll check it out for you. I can go straight to the text. I can tell you every Greek text that agrees with John chapter number 9. But the bottom line is this. If the majority text agrees with what they want to put in there, they'll use it. If it doesn't agree with what they want to put in there, they'll throw it out. They will use such a confusing mess to try to translate the Bible, it'll blow your mind. They're very inconsistent. But they'll always take something over the majority text. We're talking about the Textus Receptus, what the King James has translated. They'll, they'll take anything except that. You know what that tells me? That tells me that there is a spiritual problem going on here why they hate the King James Bible. John 9 says, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? Huios Theos. I don't know, I don't know all the... Huios is Son, Theos is God. I don't... Uh, uh, it says there in John, do you believe in the Son of God? Who is he, Lord, that I may believe? I that speak to thee am he. Does anybody in this house tonight have any other Bible than a King James? If you do, look at John 9 and see what you got. You get home this afternoon, this evening. If you've got a computer with Bible programs on it, you, got, you can get 35 translations now for practically nothing on a Bible program. And you can check every one of them with John 9 and see how they translate it. Now... This is the only passage in the New Testament that I know of. If you know of another one, let me know. Where the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the Son of God. See how quiet it is in here? You know why? That's a powerful thing. Right? Now the apostles called him the Son of God. The Jews said you make yourself to be the Son of God. Revelation 1.8 said he's the Almighty. He's referred to as the Son of God by others on many occasions. But this is where he says himself, I am the Son of God. That's a big deal. And you better believe that they assault it, they attack it, and they try to do away with it. Now, it continues to get stronger. John chapter number 11, we get into the resurrection of the dead. John 11, <coughs> verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. Then he raised his Lazarus from the dead. This is the seventh sign miracle in the Gospel of John. Don't you think that's remarkable? That the seventh, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't improve on perfection. Seven is God's number of perfection. This is the seventh sign miracle in the Gospel of John. And lo and behold, it is raising the dead. And he says, I am the resurrection, and the life. That's remarkable. But did you know there's an eighth miracle in the Gospel of John? What's that one, preacher? It's when he comes up from the dead. <laughs> John chapter number 20, verse number 15. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou whom seekest thou? John chapter number 20, verse 1, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene, early when it was yet dark, to the sepulcher. And he that was dead is now alive, and he's talking to Mary Magdalene. How many of you know what gematria is? G-E-M-A-T-R-I-A. -E -A. I've mentioned it in here in time, but it's been a while. Gematria is where a letter in the alphabet has a numerical value. That's what gematria means. It has a numerical value. Now, Greek and Hebrew, valid, because they had numerical values. English, not so. 
I know a lot of people have tried to take English words and put numerical values to the English word. That is completely arbitrary. It's just something people are doing. But Greek, yes. His name in Greek is Jesus. All right? Iota, Eta, uh, Sigma, uh, Upsilon, Sigma. I think is the spelling of it. Iesus, all right? That word, each one of those letters, if you take the numerical value of each letter and add it up, do you know what it comes out to? Eight, eight, eight. That's his number. Eight. Do you know why his number is eight? Exactly. New beginning, new beginning, new beginning. You see... When you get to seven, you've perfected it. You can't have eight and continue on. Eight means we start again. Eight is the new beginning. Eight is one. <laughs> you start counting to seven again, you see. But you've got eight. His number is eight. He is the new beginning. New beginning, new beginning, new beginning. Isn't it remarkable that the eighth miracle in the gospel of John is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? That is the new beginning. New beginning, new beginning, new beginning, new beginning. <clears throat> People were raised from the dead in the Old Testament, but they weren't really raised from the dead because they died again. When the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead, he never died again. The reason he never died again is because when he arose from the dead, he defeated the power of dead and broke its power and its chains that held people, that bound them, and it had no more authority over him. So therefore his resurrection is the greatest of all resurrections, for it is the resurrection of all humanity. If you know if you never if you can't if you if you cannot be resurrected in Christ, you won't be resurrected. You say, What about the unsaved? That's not a resurrection. The Greek word is Anastasia or Anastasis. Anastasia means a resurrection to life. He that was dead is living again. The hour is coming when all that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. They're still dead. They're walking dead people. They're dying the second death. He doesn't give them resurrection life. He simply calls them up out of the grave to come to judgment. That's a horrible thing. You see, if he gave them the same life that you've got, he'd be raising them from the dead. And he's not doing that. Because death is the penalty and the consequence of sin and rebellion. This is why the Bible says, a remarkable statement, and I think it only says it one time in the Old Testament, and I think it's in the book of Isaiah. And I want you to think about it when I say it to you. The earth will cast out the dead. Think about that. The earth will cast out the dead. Now to give you an illustration of that, go back to the book of Ezekiel, the valley of dry bones. And when Ezekiel stood there and saw that valley of dry bones, what did God say to him? He said, can these bones live? All right. What Ezekiel saw there in the valley of dry bones was a resurrection. They came back to life again. If you'll remember, when the Lord Jesus arose from the dead in the streets of Jerusalem, the Bible says after three days these graves had been opened and their bodies were lying in those graves for three days. They opened when he came out of the grave, all right? After he came out of the grave, they came out of the grave. But it says a strange thing. It only says it one time in the Bible. It says many bodies of the saints arose and walked through the streets of Jerusalem. And I've had a lot of people ask me before, and I've done a lot of, you know, thinking about that. Was that a resurrection? And I tend to believe it was not a resurrection. You say, why do you say that? Because it simply says their bodies arose and walked through the streets of Jerusalem. When the Bible talks about you, it doesn't call you your body. When it talks about you, it calls you you. Is speaking to you inside your body because you are not your body. But the bodies of the saints arose and walked through the streets of Jerusalem after his resurrection. And I'll let you take this home with you tonight. Don't you think about it. You might want to go somewhere and, and, and find some uh, 
uh, you maybe want to read a few commentaries or something, you'll find that that is one of the most uh, enigmatic scriptures, one of the most in the whole New Testament. It's not easy to figure. It's not easy to, it's not easy to put it somewhere. For example, I'll give you an illustration. When the Lord arose from the dead, he was on this earth for 40 days, right? And then at the end of 40 days, according to Acts, he ascended back to heaven. What about these people? The bodies that walked through the streets of Jerusalem, were they still here? You see? If that had been a resurrection, then they would have been here. But nothing is ever said about them again. <coughs> Not another word. It just simply says the bodies of the saints arose. Now, so what does that mean? That means that there are things in the Bible. I think God does it intentionally. That he puts things in the Bible. He just puts them in there to make you think. That everything is just not so, so, so cut and dried, simplified. We, we like to simplify things. I do too. You do too, don't you? We get it figured out. I got this thing figured out. I got this thing mastered. And then every once in a while something will pop up. And you'll find out you didn't have it mastered. <laughs> That's one of them. That's one of them. I'll show you where another one is over here in the book of 1 Corinthians 15. This is one that you need to just take it home and meditate. I don't want to mess your mind up, but I do want you to, <laughs> I do want you to look at some of this stuff and, and think about it. All right, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, uh, I'll have to find it. It's right off the top of my head. I can't think of exactly the passage. Uh, it's talking about those that are baptized for the dead. Anybody know where that is? 29? Here we go. Thank you. All right. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Well, now here's a resurrection. See, the dead rise, rise not at all. All right. They're baptized for the dead. All right. Now, I got two or three commentaries, and they'll say, well, that's just a kind of an odd way of saying that when you get saved and you're baptized, you're being baptized for the old dead person you used to be. I throw that out the door immediately. That doesn't fit here at all. That makes no sense whatsoever, does it? Does that make any sense? No. And so we have the churches today that are being baptized. People are baptized. I think the Mormons do this. They come in there. They run their genealogy. They do their genealogy. You know, they'll find their, their forebears. And they'll find one that was a bank robber and a bootlegger, I guess. And so they'll, they'll be baptized for them. I suppose. I mean, what other purpose would they have? In other words, they'll be baptized for somebody that they lived a profligate life. And maybe they can do something in a baptismal pool uh, long after they're dead that'll, that'll get them out of purgatory or something to get them into heaven. I'm not sure what their purpose in being baptized for the dead is. I throw that out the door too. I don't believe that either. So what, uh, what's going on here, preacher? Just something to make you think. <laughs> something to make you think. Baptized for the dead. Isn't that remarkable? That's not simple, is it? That's not easy. Now here's the way to tell the difference between a young preacher that's just started out and one that's been reading the Bible for a while. If you give that to a young preacher just starting out, He'll flim-flam you, and he'll run around in circles, and he'll try to make you think he knows exactly what he's talking about because he's so proud he would never admit that there's stuff in here he doesn't understand. But after you've been at this a while, you have to just be honest with people and say, well, I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't have an answer for this. Don't have an answer for it. It could be that God holds certain things in his own wisdom and purpose that he hadn't quite revealed to us yet. And I'll leave it at that. And I know this. I know the judge of the whole earth will do right. Right? So, so another one comes along and he says, well, now, the apostle Paul was simply doing, he was, he, was, he, was, he was just trying to throw this at people around there who were being baptized for the dead in an occult ritual you know, an occult religion, and he was just trying to make a mockery of them, and that's what he was doing in this text. I threw that out too. I've read about everything you can read on it, and I don't remember if I got a hold of anything that made any sense to me. So 
I make a choice tonight. Well, if I don't understand that, I'm just going to throw the whole thing away. Or, you know, Lord, <laughs> you're a whole lot smarter than I am. <laughs> I mean, I'm not the end. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not the source of knowledge of all things. I'll just let it go. Maybe you'll give me light on down the road for it. I mean, just, I know I was baptized after I got saved. Amen. And I hope you are after you get saved. But I'll leave it with God. Remember this. We've been here 6,000 years. 6,000 years. In that 6,000 year period of time, we've had every kind of culture, every kind of covenant, every kind of civilization, every kind of people that you can imagine in 6,000 years. It's unbelievable. When you go back and begin to read history, it's some of the stuff that's existed. It'll blow your mind. A lot of people have a very simplistic view to think that, well, good night. You know, America's been here for 200 and something years. I guess it's been like this for all the time. No, folks, it hadn't been like this. It hadn't been like this. this is, you're, living, you're living at the end of the end, and this is, a, this, is, this is nothing like what it had been before this country started. I mean, you don't have to go back far before you, you get back to the, where they had walls and had to live inside the walls and, to keep the, to keep the barbarians out and you don't have to go back further back too far and you'll, you'll find that men were, were living in just living. Uh, now I'm talking about outside of Israel. They were living like dogs out of the Commonwealth of Israel. They didn't know, they didn't know anything. Julius Caesar said that when he came into, uh, the British Isles, he said he came to the British Isles. He said he saw huge wickers, wicker baskets. And he said, they put men in there and they'd burn them alive. Yeah, he did. And have you ever heard the term a straw man? That's where it came from. It came from that culture. He was talking about the Druids. He said the women would come out there with long hair and their faces would be painted green and all kinds of different colors. Julius Caesar said this. Julius Caesar, the Roman general, and the, eventually the Roman, uh, 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 what do you call him? Emperor, yes. Uh, what he said about the, the British Isles is, is, is something. For example, Hadrian. How many has ever heard of Hadrian, the Roman emperor? He went over there to Great Britain and he built a wall all the way across separating uh, mostly Scotland from other parts of England because the barbarians were so vicious. He said that these people would come down from the north and they would have pictures all over their body tattooed and said they'd throw their spears up to stop them. And he said they would run up and just throw their body on top of the spear so the ones behind could come right across the top of them and attack them. Vicious. They were called picks. That's what they called them. Picks, P-I-C-T-S. They called them that because they had all these pictures on them. We're talking about vicious barbarians. So it hadn't always been the way it is here in America. God has helped to deal with human, humanity for 6,000 years. You know what he said in the book of Acts? When the apostle Paul went to Athens, Greece, and he saw, he saw a monument to the unknown God, you remember what he said? He was on Mars Hill. He said, he said let me tell you about this unknown God. Let me tell you about him. All right? He said there was a time of this ignorance, ignorance, when God winked at the ignorant, he winked at it. He said, but now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That's what he said to them. You can read that in the book of Acts. Yes, sir. That's what he said. That ought to make you think. Ought to make you think. So the gospel of John is written to these people. It's not written to the highly educated Hebrew reading Jews that lived in Jerusalem. The gospel of John is written to people who threw their bodies on spears so the ones behind them could come across the top of them. Or they went out there with their face painted up green and looked like some kind of a monster. And they put people in wicker baskets and burned them alive like the Druids did. That's who it's written to. It's written to people who don't know anything about the Bible. 
And so the Apostle John starts the book by taking them back into eternity. And he brings that eternal one, the Word of God, into their lives and says, He can save your soul. And I'll close with this one here. If you'll turn to John 6. Verse number 35. He said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said to you that ye also have seen me and believed me not. Now watch this. You've seen me and you don't believe. Here you are. You're seeing me. You've got this privilege of hearing the word. You're seeing me, but you don't believe. Watch this. All the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Isn't that wonderful? Look at verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Where's that preacher? Only in the Gospel of John. Isn't that remarkable? How that salvation in the Gospel of John is not corporate, national, it is individual. It is personal. And you come to him because he's drawing you to him. And all the Father giveth me shall come to me, and he that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. All right, I hope, that, I hope that's been a help to you. Father, in thy holy name we pray that you bless your holy word. And bless it to the hearing of the people. In Jesus' name we pray.